Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the New Testament book of Hebrews. The New Testament book of Hebrews and Hebrews in chapter number one. We're beginning a brand new series of the book of Hebrews as we just walk through this verse by verse and chapter by chapter and just spend some time in this wonderful book. It's not a long book, only 14 chapters, but you know what? There's amazing truths in it. The purpose of the book of Hebrews is to give a Old Testament commentary or a commentary on the Old Testament through the filter of Jesus Christ, to be able to point to Jesus Christ. And through it all, the big idea is that it shows that Jesus is better, that Jesus is better than the angels, Jesus is better than Moses, Jesus is better than Joshua, Jesus is better than Aaron, that Calvary is better, and that faith is a better life. All of it is talking about how Christ is better and we are better off because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And as we come to the book of Hebrews in chapter number one, we continue with this thought of exploring who Jesus Christ is. This morning we understood that Jesus Christ was the expressed image of God. That Jesus is God robed in flesh for the purpose that we can understand who he is and understand who God is. And when we know Jesus, we know God. We can personally know him. As we continued with the book of Hebrews, notice with me in the book of Hebrews chapter one, and let's begin at verse number four, the book of Hebrews chapter one and verse number four. The Bible says this, being made so much better than the angels as he hath inheritance obtained by a more excellent name than they for unto which the angels or for unto which of the angels said he at any time thou art my son this day have i begotten thee and again i will be unto him a father and he shall be to me a son and again when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world he saith let all the angels of god worship him and of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall all wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture thou <laughs> shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same. And thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible as we're speaking about angels, I want you to mark a phrase that describes what God sees or how God sees the angels, how he created the angels in the book of Hebrews chapter number one. And notice with me number uh, verse number 14 where he describes the angels and he calls them ministering spirits ministering spirits. And with the Lord's help, we would like to teach you from the word of God about angels, angels ministering spirits, angels ministering spirits. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for the great privilege it is to be here tonight and to open up your word and to learn something from your word. Again, I love the book of Hebrews because it dives in deep. It gives us some meat. It gives us something to chew on. It gives us more understanding. And I'm asking that you would give us a hunger and thirst as we go through this book, a hunger and thirst to know more about you, to see you high, holy, and lifted up, to see you as compared to the rest of the Bible of who you are, that we could worship you, that we could magnify you, that we could understand how great you are, and then we could also understand how you see us and how much you love us. Again, there's no way I could get across those truths in my own words. I do not have the words nor the intellect, but your Holy Spirit does. And so the best I know how, I surrender myself again and ask that you fill me with your precious spirit that you would get your own work accomplished through your wonderful word. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we come through here, we understand we've already seen the, the principle, the statement that Jesus is better than the angels. Well, that also tells us something special. There is a reality of angels. And that's the first thing I want to bring up to your attention as we talk about angels is the reality of angels. Angels are real. Angels are real creatures, and the Bible speaks of them. And so we don't want to just cast them off and say there's no such as thing as angels. We don't want to put them aside and say they're a mythology or something to make people feel better. The Bible says they're real, so therefore we believe they're real. And the Bible takes time to describe a little bit about angels. Now again, the context of this is to show that Jesus is better than the angels. Notice with me in verse number 4. Speaking about Jesus in verses 1, 2, and 3, verse number 4, still talking about Jesus, that Jesus being made so much better than the angels, as he hath inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Here it starts off by saying Jesus is better than the angels. The angels are good, but Jesus is better. And he has a more excellent name than the angels. And notice as it goes on, it does a comparison. It's actually referring to Old Testament passages, specifically in the Psalms. And it brings up Psalm after Psalm after Psalm, speaking about Jesus. And he's saying, you know what, to, to the angels, he didn't say this about the angels. And he didn't say about this to the angels. What he did say these about was about Jesus. Notice with me in verse 5. For unto which of the angels hath he God said at any time? Thou art my son. This day I've begotten thee. So which of the angels did God say, guess what? You're my son. None of them. Because the angels are not God. They are not the son of God. They're not Jesus. Jesus is better than the angels. He's more special than the angels because he is God. None of the angels are God. Notice at the end of verse 5 as it quotes another psalm. And again, I will be to him, speaking of Jesus, a father, and he shall be unto me a son. So which of the angels did he say, you're my son? None of them. The angels are not made to be God's children. Notice again in verse number 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten of the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. So again, Jesus has a prominent place. But there is a reality of angels. If you don't mind, we'll take a pause here. We're going to come back in just a second. But I would like to show you from the Word of God what the Bible says about angels. The first thing I want to show you in the reality of angels is that angels are higher than men, but lower than God. Angels are higher than men, but lower than God. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean that when God made creation, he made different creation unique and special. He made different creation with different abilities, different powers, different uh, <laughs> ranges, different things. For us as humans, he created a special and unique. Some people say this, that mankind is the crown jewel of God's creation. Which, think about that. With us as mankind, he made us, and you know what we do? Leave me alone, God. I can do whatever I want. We're pathetic creatures. But he made angels and he made them higher than men. What does that mean? Well, he made them where they're more powerful than men. They live longer than men. 
They have direct access to God. They can't disobey. We're going to speak more about this in a second. And we're going to talk about the reality of the angels. But compared to us, or uh, compared to angels, we're nothing. Angels are made higher than us. They're made lower than God. That's what verse number four said. Being made, speaking of Jesus, much better than the angels. So the angels are made better than us, but lower than God. Let's go through the Bible, and I'd like to show you some things about angels. First of all, or second of all, is not only do we see that angels are higher than men, but lower than God, we'll explain that through these passages. Let's first of all turn to the gospel record of Luke. The gospel record of Luke in chapter number 20. In the gospel record of Luke, chapter number 20, we learn something about angels. Now, in the context... And the gospel record of Luke, the uh, Sadducees are trying to trip Jesus up in a theological question. But when Jesus answers them, he's answering their question, but he teaches us something about angels. The gospel record of Luke chapter number 20. The gospel record of Luke chapter number 20. Notice as Jesus answers them in verse number 34. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given to marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given to marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are of the children of God and being the children of the resurrection. What we learn here is that angels are immortal. Angels are immortal. Here, when Jesus is talking, he's talking about in the resurrection when we who are believers get our brand new body, that we're going to be equivalent to angels in certain aspects. First of all, it talks about that neither can they die. Verse 26, they can die no more. Neither can the angels. Do you know that angels are immortal? Angels can't die. They live forever. They are made spiritual beings who cannot perish. They are immortal. But even though they were immortal, they, the angels were created immortal, but they were created. Angels are immortal, but they are created. We see this in the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians chapter number 1. In Colossians chapter 1, it's talking about Jesus Christ and his creative powers, that he created all things. And notice all the things that he created. So the book of Colossians. So if you find your way to Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, and notice with me in verse number 16. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. For by him, this is speaking about Jesus, for by him were all things created. That are in heaven. So by him Jesus created all things. Including those things are in heaven. And that is in earth. Visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones. Or dominions. Or principalities. Or powers. All things were created by him. And for him. Now this is speaking about general statements. But angels fit in this. Angels were created. We know that they dwell in heaven. They also have uh, power and work on earth. Jesus created everything in heaven or in earth. So when we're learning about angels. We start off by understanding the principle. Angels are made higher than man but lower than God. We understand that angels are immortal but they were created. Meaning that they had a beginning point. God is from everlasting to everlasting. Meaning he had no beginning and he had no end. In fact, God created time. But when Jesus was creating everything, not only did he create time and he created the earth and he created heaven and everything was in there, he also created the angels. Angels were not from everlasting to everlasting. Angels had a beginning point, a time when they were created. Um, someone may ask the question, when were they created? Well, <laughs> this is neither here nor there, but from my own study of the scripture, I believe that they were created in the six days of creation, and they were created when God was uh, creating all the celestial bodies in day number four. And so, to be technical, they're only two days older than Adam. 
you say, how do you know that? We'll get to that at the very, very end of this. But the principle I do want to give you, no matter where you place the creation of the angels, is that they are immortal, but they are created. They had a beginning point. Something else that we know about angels, turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 18. The book of Revelation chapter 18. Revelation in chapter number 18. And notice with me in verse 1. Revelation chapter 18. And after these things I saw another angel having come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Notice this. This angel had great power. So here's the next thing we know about angels. Angels have great power. Angels have great power. No one denies that. No one refutes that. Angels have great power. And every time they're used in, in the Bible to do something powerful, God used them. Think about the incident when all the Assyrian army is surrounding Jerusalem. And God answered Hezekiah's prayer. He's saying, God, do something. Do something. Protect us. And God had one angel, one singular, come down and kill 185,000 men just like that. That's a lot of power. You also think that Jesus, when he's up on the cross, he said, don't you think that I've got a legion of angels standing by? Well, if one angel could kill 185,000 people just like that, imagine what a thousand plus angels can do if Jesus said, you know what, turn them loose. I'm done with this. I'm not doing this cross thing. Forget this. He could have just wiped. Angels have great power. But even though they have great power, they have great power, but they must obey God. Angels have great power, but they must obey God. Look with me in Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Angels have great power, but they must obey God. God. Notice with me Psalm 103 and notice with me in verse number 20. Psalm 103 and in verse number 20. Bless the Lord ye his angels that excel in strength and do his commandments hearkening unto the voice of his word. So the angels they have great power but they have to obey God. They have to obey his word. They have to obey his voice. They have to obey God. In fact, angels are obedient to God. We're the ones who are disobedient to God. But they have great power. But even with all that power, they can't do whatever they want. They have to obey God. Something else that we learn about angels, we start off by understanding the principle that angels are higher than men, but they're lower than God. Angels are immortal, but they were created. Angels have great power, but they must obey God. Notice something else we find in the book of 2 Samuel. The book of 2 Samuel and chapter number 14. The book of 2 Samuel and chapter number 14. We're taking some time to learn about what the Bible says about angels. And again, just another obscure statement, but yet it has something we learn about here. Notice with me in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 14. And notice with me in verse number 20. This is David speaking. Notice with me in 2 Samuel 14, starting at verse number 20. To fetch about this form of speech hath thy servant Joab done this thing, and my Lord is wise according to the wisdom of an angel of God to know the things um, that to know all the things that are in the earth. Notice this. These angels, through the wisdom of an angel of God. In this, it's making a comparison, trying to explain that angels have great wisdom. In fact, they're trying to uh, compare Joab. Probably one of the few times Joab is compared to an angel. But <laughs> they're trying to say, 
Listen, you have the wisdom of an angel, meaning that angels have great wisdom. Now, even though great, the angels have great wisdom, there's something else. They're not omniscient. Angels have great wisdom, meaning they know a lot and they can apply a lot, but they are not omniscient, meaning they do not know everything. Did you know that the Bible says there are some things angels don't know? May I show you a passage? Notice with me in the gospel record of Matthew. The gospel record of Matthew chapter number 24. In Ma the gospel record of Matthew chapter number 24, Jesus is answering a question about when he's coming back. That's a good question. When is he coming back? Well, notice Jesus' answer in the gospel record of Matthew chapter 24. The gospel record of Matthew chapter 24. And notice with me in verse number 36. Gospel record of Matthew chapter 24 verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. What we understand here is there's something angels don't know. That means they are not omniscient. There's only one who is omniscient and that is God. God knows everything. The angels may know quite a bit. In fact, they know more than us. But they do not know everything. They do not know everything. So as we come to the reality of angels, we understand angels are made higher than men. But they're lower than God. Angels are immortal, but they were created. Angels have great power, but they must obey God. Angels have great wisdom, but they're not omniscient. As we come back to the book of Hebrews, we come back here and we see some more about angels that are described in the context of the book of Hebrews chapter number one. The book of Hebrews chapter number one, still learning about the reality of angels and who angels are. Notice what it says in verse number six. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten of the world, or into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. Who's that him here? That's Jesus. The angels worship God. The angels worship God. Even the angels have to acknowledge that God is God. That God is the creator God. That he is their God. They worship God. As we go on, we see something else. In, uh, notice in verse 14, it says, Are they not all ministering spirits? Something else that we see about angels, that angels are spirits. Angels are spirits, but they can appear as men. And there's many times that angels have appeared as man. By the way, angels only appear in the masculine form. There's never been a recorded thing in the Bible of angels showing up in a feminine form. They always show up in a masculine form. Neither here nor there. It may just answer a question or two later on that you may have. But angels always show up, if they show up in human form, always show up in the masculine form in the Bible. It's only recorded that they show up. So we understand that angels are spirits, and there's things that spirits can do. However, they can appear in a human form, in a likeness of a man. Now, what we've done is we've just taken some time to talk about the Bible and to show some things about the Bible, about the reality of angels. Now, as we come back to the book of Hebrews and we're learning about Jesus, we also pick up something else, the reason for angels. The reason for angels. Why do we even have angels? That's a great question. What's their purpose? Why do they exist? Well, remember as the immediate context, it's saying that Jesus is better than the angels. And so it's going to talk about Jesus for a little bit before getting to the point that we're trying to draw. What's the purpose of angels? Let's talk about the reason for angels, first of all, by looking through and seeing what he said about Christ. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number eight. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. What we see in verse number 8 is Jesus is God. 
notice this. For unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God. See, the Bible is calling Jesus God here. That Jesus is God and he is king forever. He is king. Jesus is both God and king. Notice, again, remember the, why is this a big deal? We're showing that Jesus is better than the angels. The angels is not God and the angels are not king. But Jesus is. Notice with me in verse 9, is it still talking about Jesus? Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Here again talking about Jesus. Jesus loves righteousness and he hates iniquity. You know one thing that we need to put a point on from time to time? Jesus hates sin. God hates sin. You say, which sins? All sins. God hates all sins. Somewhere along the lines, we, in order to make ourselves feel better, have categorized sins. And so if we were to use Catholic terminology, we have cardinal sins and venial sins. And we say that as long as we do these small little sins, we're fine. No, 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 no. God hates all sin. He hates all sin. That little white lie, God hates it. Cheating on your taxes, God hates it. Not doing the work that you're paid to do, God hates it. God hates all sin. Now, we'll also say not all sin has the same consequences. But God hates all sin. There's not a little sin where he says, oh, it's all right, that's so cute. God doesn't think any sin is cute. God hates all sin. That's part of him being God, a righteous God, a holy God. God hates sin. Notice again, it's still talking about Jesus. Verse number nine. Um, verse number 10, rather. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. We made mention of this in Colossians, but Jesus made everything. Jesus created the world. You can't say that of any of the angels because they were created. Jesus is the creator. Angels are creation as are we and everything else that's in the world. Jesus is the creator. Notice in verse number 11 and 12. They, speaking about the heavens and earth, they shall perish. But thou, Jesus, remains. They, the heavens of the earth, shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shall thou fold them up, meaning heaven and earth, and they shall be changed. But thou, Jesus, art the same, and thy years shall not fail. You know, we can understand this. It's doing poetical language. None of you have had the same clothes Year after 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 year. I mean, you may have something that you may kind of keep preserved, your favorite high school jacket that you can't fit in anymore, but it's still in the closet. But the one thing is that our, our clothes wax old. That's why we have to go to the store every couple of months. You know, kids, they go through shoes all the time. They keep getting these big feet and they get busting them out. They, they wax old. Your clothes, you can't wear them <coughs> over and over indefinitely. They're going to wear out. Things always wax old and old. By the way, that's a scientific principle of the second law of thermodynamics that everything tends towards disorder. Everything falls apart. And one day, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because this old one's going to be worn out and Jesus is going to have to make a new one. But the one thing that's constant and the one thing that's true Jesus never changes. Jesus never changes. He never gets old. He never fails. He'll never get senile. He'll never need a break. He'll never have to take a nap. He'll never run out of gas. He never changes. That's the one thing about Christ is he never changes. Notice as we get to verse number 13, as we start getting back into the context of angels. Verse number 13. But to which of the angels said he, God, at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool? That promise was not made to the angels. He didn't say to the angels, I'm going to make your enemies a footstool. But he did tell Jesus that I'm going to make your enemies a footstool. Jesus is better. So why did God create the angels? 
Jesus seems to have everything in hand. Why did God create the angels? This is going to be key. Verse number 14. Are they, speaking of the angels, not all ministering spirits? The word minister carries the idea of a servant. So they are servant spirits. Sent forth to minister or to serve for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. Who inherits salvation? Not the angels. Do you know the angels don't understand salvation? It confuses and befuddles them. They can't understand how some lowly creature can wave his fist at God and say, I'll do whatever I want. And then get saved and all of a sudden their life changes. The book of Ephesians chapter 3 says every time we have a church service, the angels are walking, watching from heaven, looking down and say, only God can do that. It shows the manifold wisdom of God that only God could take us from different backgrounds, different heritages, different places of the country, different ages, different likeness, different intelligence, different um, uh, educational backgrounds, different skills, different opportunities, and put us here and we worship Christ together. It baffles the angels. How can they who hated God worship him? Why do they not understand it? Because salvation was never made for them. Jesus did not die for the angels. But you know who he died for? He died for us. We're made lower than the angels. Angels are better than us. But he didn't die for us. He died, or he died for them. He died for us. He died for us. You know how humbling that is? These angels that have to obey God. These angels with great power. And God chose to die for our sins. Because he wants to fellowship with us. He wants to spend time with us. And you know why he created the angels? For them, these mighty powerful creatures, to be our ministering spirits for them to serve us for them to protect us for them to watch over us he created these higher beings who are so powerful so wise who are immortal who never die to take care of us the heirs of salvation that's amazing that God would choose to love us that manner that he would create these beings to be our ministering spirits. There is a reality of angels. This reality is, is that God created them to take care of us. You know, we don't see the spiritual side of things. There are many things that we do not see. We see the physical, but we don't know the things that God says, hey angel, go take care of this for me. It could be that he allowed your car not to work right until you kicked it in a couple times to help you avoid an accident that you were going to be in. My pastor, who very much gets distracted, someone says that God has protective angels around every pastor's car because they're thinking about everything else. He'd make U-turns in the middle of a busy highway to go witness to someone across the street, not even seeing traffic. And we always joked about how many angels were bruised as they were protecting the car from... There's a reality of that. That there are angels that protect us because we are the heirs of salvation. We're going to be co-heirs with Jesus. We're going to inherit the same things that Jesus is going to inherit because Jesus made us co-heirs with him. That's a humbling fact. That they're here to serve us, to protect us at God's command. Who, was, who is man? That thou shalt be mindful of us, the Bible says in Psalm 8. Who are made lower than the angels. Who are we that God would choose to love us like this? There is a reality of the angels and the purpose of them. The reason why God created them, because he had us in mind. He had us in mind to create these powerful beings. What a wonderful God that we have. That not only did he die for us, but he also created these angels to protect us because of his love for us. 
What a wonderful God. So we bring up this idea here. We know what there's a reality of angels and we know the reason of the angels. He did it for us. So what are you doing with your salvation? The next chapter talks about so great salvation. And God has given us so great salvation. What are you doing with this salvation? Do you appreciate the salvation that you had? You appreciate that how much God has loved you. He loved you enough to die on the cross for you. He loved you enough to create the angels to protect you, to watch over you, to guard you, to help you in things you don't even see and that you're not even aware of because he loved you. The Bible talks about that the goodness of God leadeth us towards repentance. Are you thankful for this goodness of God that he would love you this much? Well, if you are thankful, then it should change our behavior towards him. I don't have to go to church. I get to go to church. I don't have to read my Bible. I get to read my Bible. I don't have to pray. I get to pray. Because of how great God is. I have a responsive love. The more that I realize all that God has done for me. How can I not be thankful to him? How can I not worship him? How can I not do my best for him? When he has done so much for me. Things that I don't even know and understand. Even on a daily basis. How he has these majestic creatures that honestly... Have more power than me. I'm nothing but a speck. And yet they are there to protect me. To guide me. To watch over me. What a wonderful God. Now again we don't worship angels because they're not God. They are servants like we are. They're serving God to take care of us. But man. How humbling it is. To think about that God created them. To take care of us. And yet we still have the audacity to tell God. I don't care. I want to do whatever I want. Just this one time. I want to do what I want. Just this one time. I want to have my bad attitude. Just this one time. I want to have my sin. Just this. How can we do that? When God has done so much for us. As we come to this application. We're just coming to something simple. Our you thankful are you thankful you know we're not trying to change your behavior we're not expecting you to expose a bunch of sin but we should be thankful thankful for the love that God has for us especially when you get to the poochy lip disease that everybody hates me nobody likes me think I'll eat some worms woohoo How can you get in that place when you realize all that God has done for you? That he loves you. He accepts you. He has these ones watching over us. No wonder we can say this. The joy of the Lord is my strength. My joy comes from knowing him. When I think about that, how can I be disturbed with the world around me that's falling apart? When Jesus never changes. And he's still watching over me. And he's protecting me. And he cares for me. My joy comes from him. I can go on another day. Because he lives. I can go on further. Because I know how much he cares for me. What a great God. What a great Savior. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. 
6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.